Hunt is on for high school graduates who left the college path. Melissa Korn, The Wall Street Journal. The tagline is, schools use phone calls and scholarships to lure pandemic graduates back to campus. So here's the numbers. 727,000 fewer students enrolled in undergraduate programs this spring compared to the same time last year. And that number is about the same for this fall according to the National Student Clearinghouse. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the share of new high school graduates who enrolled in colleges last year is the lowest in 20 years, just shy of 63%. And to make matters worse, many others who started school in the fall, quote, quickly dropped out like droves. We've always known about the concept of summer melt, the process where students who are supposedly committed for a college don't show up after the summer, but all the statistics show that summer melt worsened. For example, according to the Metro Nashville Public Schools, 1,750 of their students just melted away during the summer. That's a melt rate of 42%, or 1,000 more students than the previous year. And then those in already in college, according to Nashville, they dropped out in droves. Only 59% of first-year students stayed for the following year. That's down from 75% the time, year before. So the question is what to do about this process. And what the article suggested was three main things. Number one, identifying the target market of the kids who are not showing up. Number two, advi expanding advising programs to try and get current students to commit to college. And number three, increasing scholarships to allow those hit by the financial hardships of the pandemic and other realities to actually be able to afford college. So Mark, I wanna throw it out to you for discussion. Yeah, thanks Dave, great summary as usual. You know, in a, in a lot of ways, this is a continuation of what we discussed last week. Uh, we looked at an article from John Marcus from the Heckinger Report that looked at how colleges face a reckoning as plummeting birth rates are accelerating enrollment declines. And then we finished with our last part talking about what are five things colleges can do to combat that. And I hope by now it's clear to anyone that all of all of the hype, all of the buzz about how hard it is to get into colleges is really, really you know, the exclusive territory of a very small percentage of schools that are not the majority of schools in, in the country. Sure, that is no question. It, you know, it's been a feast or famine when college admissions recently where the rich have gotten richer, not only financially, but also in terms of enrollment applicants. And so you have 10 percent of the schools of the 2400 schools, 2400 four year accredited schools, about 10 percent, maybe even less than 10 percent. You've got your selective privates basically in your flagships that have been experiencing a surge, and then all the rest. I mean, community colleges have been hit so hard. It's been unbelievable. Dave and I have talked about that. Regional publics have been hit really, really hard. And then um, less selective privates have been hit really, really hard. So we've talked about that for a while, and hopefully that's your main impression, is that, wow, it's, this pandemic's been very, very, very difficult for colleges, which in effect creates more of an opportunity for you as a student as you have more clout. This article looks at it from a different angle, and and the one thing that I want to point out um, in this article, last week we did talk about five things that colleges are doing to combat uh, this enrollment decline. And one thing that this article points out is a different way that wasn't mentioned last week. And I, I want to comment on it. it because colleges are getting creative at going after students. You have to in an area of scarcity. And so here's a, a couple quotes. So it talks out, starts out talking about Lynn Bennett Community College in Albany, Oregon. And it says they are offering $500 scholarships to 2,600 students who stopped attending during the pandemic. And they're trying to lure them back with these scholarships. And they're not the only ones that are doing this. The article also talks about Wilkes Community College in North Carolina and how roughly 900 students graduated in 2020 from high schools in that local area, two hours north of Charlotte, and only 420, or 420 of them haven't enrolled in college. 
So what Wilkes is doing is they're offering a thousand dollar scholarships for tuition, for books, other school related expenses, and they're having students call them from their own high schools to make the pitch. And they say normally they could expect about a two to five percent success rate, but they're hoping that the financial incentive and the peer phone calls will yield a much better result. And the school actually has reached out and secured $40,000 uh, from a, a scholarship from some local foundations um, that they're using to fund this program. And so I, I just want people to see how creative schools are getting at trying to combat the decline in applications. I want to go back to um, a conversation I have with Courtney Minden from VP of Enrollment at Babson in my interview with her, not the one on Babson, but the one about the new creative ways colleges are recruiting. And um, if you haven't heard that interview, I'd recommend you listen to it. It's very recently uh, aired on our podcast. Um, and by the way, all the air, all the interviews in their entirety are on uh, your collegemonkid.com. You don't have to see part of it on episode one, part of it episode two. You can hear the whole thing on its entirety and soon to be on YouTube by the end of the in the next couple of days. So, but in my conversation with Courtney, you know, and I, I said, Courtney, so many people, other admission officers have said that we've had a virtual bonanza. It's been incredibly effective. It's been great for for student panels. It's been great for virtual quick Zoom sessions with financial aid counselors. It's been great for um, information sessions and 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 webinars and a lot of special and creative programming that they've done online classes. It hasn't been that great, though, for fairs. We haven't found a way to make fairs work well. And that's the one thing that has been a little bit of a bust virtually. And I asked her, has that been your experience? And and Courtney said, yeah, that's true. But guess what? In-person fairs haven't been working for us for a long time either. They really haven't. Like we spent all this money on airfare, hotel, rent a car and meals to fly in. And you go to a fair. And you think you're going to reach rising seniors. They pretty much already know what schools they're interested in. So they go to the tables of who they're interested in. So the people maybe you talk to, maybe were people that were already interested in you. It's a pretty expensive model. Uh, and we're questioning the ROI. And I'm bringing this up because what, I've, what I'm observing and seeing, Dave, since the pandemic, the pandemic feels like it enabled colleges to have this complete epiphany about how they recruit. And almost every single school, in fact, I can't even think of an exception of an admission officer that I talked to that wasn't shocked with how effective the virtual events were that they did, with how large the attendance was. And what it's caused them to do is to just take a whole look and say, let's take a whole look at our whole recruiting. And what we did, and for so many years, it was just autopilot. You get on the fall, admission officers go on the road, eight to 12 weeks, living out of a suitcase, fairs, you know, presentations at Marriott's and stuff like that, school visits, receptions, come back, go into reading season. And, and all of a sudden, that was just completely turned upside down because I couldn't do it. And one of the things that I'm seeing schools do, and I, and I predict this is going to happen on steroids over the next five years is, um, I don't know, have you ever heard of this book, Blue Ocean, Blue Ocean Strategy? I don't know if you know that book, Dave. Yes, no? Uh, no, I, no, I'm not familiar with that one, yeah. So basically, it, 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 you know, it, it's, it's a marketing book, right? And it's like most people are fishing out of the same ocean. Try a Blue Ocean Strategy, which is something nobody else does. And rather than just be a copycat of what everybody else is doing. So like a Blue Ocean approach is, why don't we target more non-traditional students? Why are we chasing so many, eight, like there's so many people that put their focus on the 18 to 19 year old high school graduate that comes residentially and lives in the dorm. Everybody's like crowding and hurting into that market. And what I see people really starting to realize is, wait a minute, there's literally more non-traditional students than there are traditional. And so we've talked on this podcast before, some of the non-traditional students are the 27, the 35 year old that's working you know, working a job or two jobs that can, you you know, you beef up your online program. We've talked about that at length, but here's a real creative approach. Why don't we micro target the people that either started and stopped or the people that never came because of the pandemic that are local in our area? 
And so I think you're going to see a lot more of that out of the box type thinking like that. Uh, thoughts, Dave? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you know, they talked about this uh, National Clearinghouse database and that other organizations like the Oasis Center were actually doing this micro-targeting and that they were able to go back eight years and see exactly where this, what happened to the students and try and reach them. So, yeah, I think it's extremely effective. Yeah, let me say something about the National Clearinghouse because they, they are the definitive source, right? So, yeah. so they have... Uh, they track where people end up and it's a subscription service, but it's pretty nominal. Like at KIPP, we pay for it because it enables us to find out where every one of our students actually is. Like we have a whole service. We have just in Atlanta alone, we have four people on a team that that visit kids in college, track them in college, um, do everything we can to make sure that they graduate. But even with four people just in Atlanta, dedicate it to that. We still don't always know where people are because not everybody chooses to communicate with you. And so you have your list of your high school graduates. You have your list of initially who enrolled in college. But the, the clearinghouse allows us to see, oh, wow, this, 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 this student is like at, you know, at like Oregon State right now. So it allows you, allows you to see where people are and, and it's worth it. So it's a service that we pay for and it is the definitive no question about it. No, but no other source can compete with it for its accuracy and its comprehensiveness. Because that's what they're referring to. And you'll hear us mention the, the clearinghouse um, quite a bit because it really is the definitive source. If you want to actually know what happened to students, where they where they are after they graduate. So, Dave, what should our takeaway be for our listeners? Well, the takeaway is that there is an untapped market. I agree. Uh, you know, I, like if you compare colleges to any other business, what other business could survive literally losing 40% of their customer base in one year? I mean, that's what's happening. You know, this one statistic, 59% of first year students stay, you know, that's, you're losing 41%. What's happening to those 41%? And at a time, if you think about it, if the colleges can conquer that problem, how to recapture the 41%. That takes care of all the demographic cliffs, the, the demographic uh, uh, problems that they have going forward, just trying to recapture the markets that they've already got at the end of high school, but they're losing one year later. Yeah, and I'm going to do one of those some things I do every now and then. It's a tease. So I'm going to share recommended resource in our recommended resource section, which our regular listeners know is halfway in the middle of the interview, we break away from the interview and I do a recommended resource. This is one that a listener sent in that it explains why graduation rates are so low, better than any source I've seen. And if you um, check out the source, you'll understand why graduation rates are so low at certain places and, and why you have to be really careful at using that metric as a way of evaluating colleges. So um, stay tuned for that. I'm going to tease it out now. So you listen to it. And it's, so I definitely want you to check out the source. Um, there are very, very understandable reasons why graduation rates are low. And that, once again, just makes the problem that more Herculean and hard to solve. I want to make a guess that much of it has to do with finances and the you got that right. That's the financial vulnerability of many of these kids trying to get into college. So, yep, yep. It's you bingo, bingo, winner, winner, chicken dinner. Right. And 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 so uh, Dave gave gave away a little bit of the thunder, but it's still I still want you to check it out because that's a lot more comprehensive than that. But you're definitely fishing in the right ocean there. Which is why I just wanted to make one last comment. You know, they talked about increasing scholarships, but I was underwhelmed at the amount of money that they were giving away. They mentioned Lynn Barton Community College at $500 and Wilkes Community College at $1,000. Well, Mark, you and I know that we're talking about tens of thousands necessary to actually successfully complete a year. So we're still- Well, wait a minute, Dave. So, so a couple of things. So a couple of things. So community colleges, don't they're not flush with money. Right. And and secondly, the average cost of a community college in the country is about thirty seven hundred dollars. So so keep in mind that um, they're almost all commuter schools. So there's no r room and board expenses, and they're 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 you know so a thousand dollars could be that's more than a quarter of the average total costs. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of times students re re receive the Pell Grant, 
And so that can cover that. And there's 20 states now that provide some aspect of free college, mostly for community college. So so you really could be offering them all expenses paid if you throw in a little Pell, a little state-based aid, state, state based aid. You know, it goes back a lot to what we were talking about last week, Dave, and or maybe it was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, yeah, it was a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about guys and why why so many guys are dropping out. And, um, you know, and, and one of the reasons is, you know, they get an opportunity to make $15, $17, $19 an hour. Um, that, that can be appealing. And especially in some cases, they're making more money than their parents are making. And so that can look like incredibly successful opportunity for them. So it's it's in in some of these cases they're they're really making the case it's of uh, the long term investment in you getting an education will help you more in the long run. And you're you're oftentimes pushing up against, yeah, but I've make you know my mom needs this money or I'm making more money than my dad makes, and you know I can pay for a car and this that and the other. So you know each position has its own challenges, but the community college appeal. It's a, it's it's typically a different student and it's different. It's a whole different cost structure than than the 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollar four year residential, you know, private school, public school, flagship school, that kind of thing. That makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense.